The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them light has shone. You have multiplied the nations. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with the joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. Here's why. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and he shall be called, are you ready? Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Amen? You may be seated. You may be seated. Hey, it's good to see you guys today, and welcome to Advent Week 2 where we are looking at the uh, possibility, the reality, and the need for peace, for peace. And uh, as, I'm, as I'm thinking about peace and what that looks like among us, um, uh, th there's, there's this uh, important place that we start. It's always important to know where you are, okay? You're at the Avenue Church, Delray Beach. Welcome, welcome. But you're also in the land of in-between, you're in the land of in-between. If there's any Stranger Things fans out there, it's like the upside down world, but not, okay? It's not. But it's, we call it the land of in-between, which means we're in between two things. Jesus came and he's coming again, okay? And so those are two things we believe that should radically affect how I live today, right now. The fact that there's, there's two things going on. Whoop, am I stopping? What's happening? Oh, okay, cool. We were going after it so hard we lit three. That's the fire of the Holy... No, no, no. Just, we, just, we just lit one too many. That's cool. That's cool. I'm going to keep going, though, all right? If it lights up again, you know something's going on, okay? All right. So, so how do we live now, man? Like how, how is it that we live in this land of in-between? I, I think... How do we thrive, actually? I think there's um, um, a great, great merit in uh, Melissa Kruger's thoughts on this. Uh, we started last week with this quote. I'm going to read it again. As believers, we look back, but we also look forward. Just as our children delight. You got any kids in here that are delighting in Christmas? Oh, yeah. hey, I don't care about your age. I'm going to go ahead and raise mine. Sometimes I think I'm perpetually like 14, but well, that's cool. That's a whole other issue in sermon. But listen, I'm super delighted in Christmas. And if you're around kids anywhere from the age of three to however old you know you might be, you know there's like a, a, a like a mystery. There's a magic about Christmas, as there should be. They also look forward to what awaits them under that tree. More is yet to come. As his people, we look back and remember that Christ has come and redeemed the world. We look forward and hope for that day when he will come again, making all things new. More is yet to come. Can we, can we all say that together? Ready? More is yet to come. I said, if there was only one thing that you got out of all this stuff, it would be that. And so I asked, you know, my daughter and I, my 17 year old, we talk about like takeaways, what'd you like, whatever. She told me that. So she got the one thing I wanted her to get. So that was awesome. That was awesome. It was early in the message too, so she might have like popped out and it's like, I got it. I, I know how to answer dad in about 40 minutes, so we're good. I don't know. But more is yet to come. That's exciting. That's exciting, especially if you take a look at our world today. Because our world today is not as it should be. It, it is not, as you might call it, like um, a, an incredibly peaceful place. And it's interesting because Jesus has a couple of really amazing promises. I mean, it's not like there's any promise that's not amazing that he makes, but this one, here, here's what he promises his disciples, and we'll look at this in a little bit later, in, in a little bit deeper context, is my peace I give to you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, but I'm giving you like what's inside of me, I'm, I'm giving it to you. And then transferably, that's a promise that we receive through faith in his finished work. And so, I mean, I, I just wrote down a couple of thoughts on our world today. These are some things that kind of um, bring some, some clarity as to why peace is a really big deal like today. Uh, divorce, abuse, lawsuits, depression, anxiety, addiction, the fact that there are 3% that identify as Christians in the South Florida area, 3 
percent. I mean, it, it's, not, it's, it's not really what you would call like thriving in peace. And so the question is, is it possible for my heart to thrive in peace when the world around me is not? Is that a possibility? Because Jesus is not like surprised. It's not like the world was amazingly better when he gave this promise to the disciples and then it just slipped out of control. I mean, it's always been pretty chaotic, at least, at least after, the, after the garden scene. And so what we want to look at here is, is man, if it's possible to have peace in an, in an unpeaceful world, what is that peace? What would it look like? Let's take a minute just to define peace. Uh, the biblical term peace means shalom. Uh, and it's this idea that travels all the way through the garden to the new city. That's, I love that because I'm, uh, that, that's, the, that's the in-between, but, but in biblical terms. We started in a garden. Humanity started in a garden. And, and the redeemed of the Lord will end up in a, in a new city. Now, I'm, I'm a little bit more of a city guy than I am a farmer guy, so that works for me. Okay? If you're a farm boy, farm girl, it, it, just trust me. It's going to get better. Okay? And, but we're in the in-between now, and, and something uh, is not right with our world. Like, like, we lost what we had, and Jesus is now on mission to bring it back. And it's this, this concept called shalom, or peace. And so when you see peace most of the time in the scriptures, it will have this, and it depends on the context, but it'll have this, um, this sort of overall meaning of shalom. Now, shalom, could be tra- it could be looked at as like um, harmony. Harmony, well-being, wholeness. And specifically, um, there's, there's usually three areas that we can lean into when it comes to harmony. Um, there's harmony between uh, us and the Lord, so horizontal harmony. Uh, there's harmony uh, that's vertical harmony between one another, that's, that's relational harmony, peace. And there's harmony on the inside. There's, there's what's going on um, out here. There's a fourth harmony that we're not going to really talk a lot about today, which is like the harmony between us and creation. But that's another harmony that was lost in the garden that, that we walk through um, today. And, and, and so um, what we want to do is, man, we're looking at this, this, this concept of what was had has now been lost. Jesus promises to restore it. So now what should I be as a child of God? What should, I, what should my expectations be of experience? How should I be um, experiencing? And is it is it really fair for me to think of myself as being able to thrive in this harmony, to thrive um, in this peace, uh, relationally, internally, and spiritually? Before we um, hop into our first uh, passage, which we've actually already did, it kind of sets the context for us. It's from Isaiah, um, the one that I read to you. Uh, there, there's, this, there's this picture of a, of a peace that's coming, but here's what I love about the peace in Isaiah. It's a... Um, It's a peace that requires war. If you caught what I was saying in the Isaiah, I'm not saying, I was just reading it, but if you caught what I read in the Isaiah passage, there's a light that's shown, and then there's a prince of peace at the end. But in between, there's there's a war. There's a robe that was dipped in blood. Things were broken. The the battle of Gideon and and Midian is referenced. Um... The Lord's been pressing on my heart, I believe, like this week, this idea of um, there's, a, there's a costliness to peace. And as a matter of fact, there, there's, a, there's a power to peace that conquers. And so what we're going to look at today is, is this concept of a, of a conquering peace. It's not a peace that like you might think of when you go into the spa and it's all like, ooh. You know, and like, it smells good, and you're like, what's that smell? I don't know, but it always smells like I'm in a spa, and, and there's music, and you're just super chill mode. Most of us think about peace in that way, but I want us to think a little differently about peace today. I want us to think biblically about peace. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but I want us to think about this idea of a peace that comes in and conquers the chaos that's going on in here and out here and up here. That, that the peace of Christ is a powerful peace, that it came at a great price from a great warrior who is the prince of peace, and it's meant to conquer things that have probably conquered you for years. Let's look at that. So, if you have your Bibles, um, we're going to be in Luke and then in Matthew. 
Uh, and, and so uh, you're going to be hearing some of the, the Christmas story, and uh, we're, we're going to see what that has to do with this idea of uh, peace. So uh, Luke, beginning in chapter 1, beginning in verse 26, uh, you're going to meet uh, Mary here. Um, many of you may be familiar with who Mary is and sort of a Judeo-Christian concept, and she's the, the mother of Jesus. And you know, I don't know what your thoughts are on her or what your history is with Mary, um, but we're going to take a look at Mary, and, and we're, going to, we're going to take a look at Joseph. We're going to do it in, from a perspective of, like, God's conquering peace. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Next slide, please. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Keep going. He will be great. And he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Anybody familiar with that passage? Anybody? Okay. I mean, you know, whether it's your first time in church or not, or you just watch Charlie Brown stuff, whatever. You probably, you, you probably have some sort of an idea of, okay, oh, that's when Mary heard about, like, baby Jesus, and, um, you know, that's, uh, you, you kind of maybe have that concept uh, happening. There's a lot that's happening there, right? I mean, um, we're not going to break down all of it, uh, but, but certainly, you know, you've, you've got a lot of different elements that are work there. Uh, you've got a character named Gabriel who's an angel, who's a messenger of God. You've got someone named Mary who appears to be highly favored, and what does that mean, and all these sort of things. And you've got, you've got um, her being a virgin and her understanding her life skills very well and saying, how am I supposed to be pregnant if I've never been with a man? And, and the angel then explaining to her, well, this is a different set of life skills that's going on. This is super life supernatural life skills. And, and the Holy Spirit will come and you will be, con what will be conceived in you will be from the Holy Spirit. And, and so we've got a couple of like important facts here. Uh, one of which is what we would call um, like a, a virgin, a virgin um, conception. Like that, that Mary was able to conceive a child and be pregnant with a child without um, having sex with another man. Like that's a huge concept for the Christian faith. And there's no compromise there. It's not like, I, I definitely believe Jesus died for my sins, but I'm not so sure about the, that weird virgin birth thing. Like, Jesus can't die for your sins if he was not conceived of a virgin because he would have been born with a sin nature. But he was perfect. And so you see that um, he was fully human because he was born, but you see that he was fully God because he was born of a virgin. So this, con this, this reality, this theology, is it's not one that we can compromise on and, and then raise your hand and say, yeah, I'm a born-again Christian. Like, I, I'm totally into what Jesus is. No, you're not. This is fundamental to understanding who Jesus is. There's no compromise here. And so we're going to look at a, a, few, a few aspects of this that maybe tell a little bit of a bigger story, but you know, there is another guy involved here, right? And his name is Joseph. Joseph, let's, let's read about how Joseph kind of encounters um, this because, you know, like if just to, just, a, just a second, right? Just a second of like, let's, the reality of this is, I, I love my wife, you know? I love her, I trust her, I trust you, baby. I trust you so much, baby. But um, if, if this news is brought home to me, there's, a, there's definitely um, a conversation, there's an intervention, there's a me like getting around my people and being like, what is she, like it's just, it's gonna be one of those hard things to swallow, okay? It's gonna be like, all right, I just, I need maybe a little bit more, okay? And so let's not brush over the reality of what's happening here and, and just kind of think, okay, well, Joseph, he was probably cool with it. I love the scriptures because here's what Joseph was gonna do. Probably the same thing a lot of us would do who love Jesus and, and love the people we're with. Oh, you know what? You, you had an affair. 
and um, I, I, you know, I love you, and maybe we're really going to try to work that out, or we can't work that out, and like, I, you know, are you seeing this guy? Like, we're going to enter into, we're going to try to get back to reality. Like, I know you're talking about some weird thing with, with Gabriel. Is that the guy? Like, who, like what's happening here? <laughs> like, I, what do you, just, just be honest with me, baby. I just want to know what happened. So this is how God enters the world, in that type of chaos. So here's, here's how Joseph gets told some stuff. Uh, now the birth of Jesus Christ took this place in this way. This is from the Gospel of Matthew. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, this idea of betrothed is uh, first you got engaged, then you got betrothed. Engagement was kind of between the dads. Betrothal was a more official thing where you actually had to become divorced if you were betrothed, and then you were married. But you weren't, you weren't being together physically when you were betrothed. There was still a process that, that was happening here. Before they came together, okay, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Next slide. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, I mean, quite frankly, in this context, this could have, this could have been like a death sentence to Mary had he wanted to push it in, in this category, potentially, potentially. Um, uh, he resolved to divorce her quietly, okay? So he's a good dude. He doesn't want to make much of it. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, Okay? Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Okay, so there's some, there's some prophetic stuff going on here. So we look back 700 years before, and we see that he's referencing Isaiah. And behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Okay, what else? Does he get any other information? What's he do? Now, if, if, you're, if I'm Joseph... There's, I'm going to look out there. There's some people who like really know how my mind works. All right. If I'm Joseph, I am on like this obsession. Like my, my OCD is spinning. My anxiety is out of control. And I'm definitely rehearsing. Was that an angel or not? Did I really hear from God or not? Like, this is, this is crazy. And I'm, like, gripped in, like, rehearsing what happened. And I'm just, I'm caught up in me. I'm not thinking about obedience. I'm not thinking about giving it up for the, for the cause of the God that I say I love. I'm thinking about what's best for me and self-preservation. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth, and he called his name Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is the hero, guys, of this passage, but there's some secondary heroic efforts that are happening here. Um, my, my first kind of teaching slide is titled this. Check it out. Come on, man. <laughs> so if you're not into like NFL and ESPN and Sports Center, that's kind of a thing that you know guys would do when they were when, when they would review um, the, the plays of the week. There'd be a couple plays of the week where guys they, they'd watch and they'd be like, "Come on, man." And it'd be like, you know, maybe somebody made this like horrible play or whatever. It was just kind of like, come. So may, if, that's not, it's not, if that's not you, maybe you're more like, for real? Like, for real? You, I mean, this sounds like you're selling me a Billy Goods here. Like, this, is, this is how God's going to start his story? This is how he's going to enter humanity? Like, for real? Or maybe some of you are back, you know, to like the Seinfeld era, where you remember the Seinfeld, where they're like, stop, and they're like pushing each other over back and forth, okay? So if you're over 40, you're like, yeah, I remember that one. If you're not, you're like, who's Seinfeld? I was, did he appear on The Office? I'm not sure. So whatever. <laughs> but like, but, but there's this idea of, like, stop it. Who do you think I am? I just think it's important for us to realize that um, there's chaos on the scene here. This is not the fairy tale wedding. This is not, okay, a couple did it right all the way. Now they're married, had a few years to get to know one another. Okay, have a baby, cool, got good jobs. This is, this is not kind of like everyone applauding the American sort of Christian dream of, of how God works. This is unwed couple pregnant. A total mess. God's like, we're going to do it that way. It's, it almost, if you like familiarize yourself with the scriptures, it almost seems like God loves that sort of pattern. 
chaos to peace, death to resurrection. Seems like that's his way. A couple of notes that I think are important for us to, to know here as, as, we, as we move along in our chew to the scriptures. Betrothed, I already explained that to you. Exalted one. Um, we, we don't want to um, do too little or too, or too less with Mary. When, when it says exalted one, like that's, it's, she was picked to do this. But it doesn't give her status that's anywhere near Jesus. It's like she had an awesome, important role to do in the kingdom of God. And you know what? So does Aaron. And so does Megan. And so, so yes, like man, that what she did is, is historic and it's set apart in a lot of ways, but we don't want to over capital E exalt her to a place where it starts messing with where Jesus lives and reigns. And we also don't want to under exalt her and say, well, yeah, it's just, you know, whatever, just another day in Mary's life, you know? It's not, no, 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 God chose her in a really specific and beautiful way to do something glorious, all right? So let's, let's honor Mary for her courage and, and her obedience and how she leaned into that moment. But let's make sure that we, we keep, it, keep it where the scriptures keep it. And, and a, a couple other thoughts. There, there's some... There's some Trinitarian talk here. When you start to hear the words great son, um, David's promised for, forever heir, I mean, th- these, are, these are some really um, big things that are happening here in, in the context of this chaos, and, and we're going we're gonna to look at them in a little bit more here. The, the one thing that you can see is that there's, there's some dreams that are important. And what's powerful in this case is, is like um, when, the, when the, the Lord gives you a word. When the Lord gives you a word, and what's really cool is he anchors his, his new word to what he's already been doing. Do you, understand? do you understand that? It's not like he's giving them a word and telling them to do something that's against his character or his nature. As a matter of fact, they are able to proof text this, this sort of new word of God and go back 700 years and be like, oh, that's where this is coming from. Like, I can see it in the Bible. If you can't see a word of the Lord in the Bible, it's probably not a word from the Lord. It's probably that weird dream that I said that I would be, like, overanalyzing. But you know what was cool to Joseph? And 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 in this situation, he links it to Isaiah. And so, you know, like, let's let's do a little investigative work, okay? Let's let's see what this looks like here. And so... um, you know, we've, we've, we've talked about this week and, and even a little bit more last week um, what was going on in Isaiah 700 years before. In Isaiah 9, I read that for you, and in Isaiah 7, that's where we're going to do some investigative work, okay? And we're just going to see, um, it, does this thing, like, like measure up to, to what we read here? And I, I, I think it's in your outline. I went ahead and, and highlighted some of the things that are in both of these passages and can also be found 700 years prior in Isaiah. Okay, so you with me on that? So here, here they are. I'm just going to list them real quick. Um, of, oh, yep, it's on the screen. Perfect. In Isaiah 7, you're going to find that um, there was a virgin that was said to, to the, the people of, of Israel could, uh, God's people could look for, and she was going to uh, be pregnant, and it was gonna be, she's going to be pregnant with Emmanuel. Okay, so this idea of a virgin birth and God with us was not new. It was actually 700 years prior to when they tell Mary and Joseph this. And then also in Isaiah 9, you see that um, he, here's what's going to help us not walk in gloom. Here's, what's gonna, here's, here's like the Prince of Peace. Here's the person who's going to change everything. He's going to be a son. He's going to be mighty God, so he's going to be divine. Um, he's going to have the throne of David and his kingdom forever. That's really important because the Old Testament... God has promised that he was going to work through this fa- David's family. David, you're always going to have a throne on the air. Wait, an heir on the throne, sorry. <laughs> an heir on the throne. And it doesn't seem to work out. It's like Solomon's kind of a bust a little bit, and then after that it just goes off the hill. It's like, where did that promise go? Well, what we're seeing here is that Jesus is going to be the ultimate fulfillment because he's coming out of the line of David. He's going to be the ultimate fulfillment of this prophecy, that David would have a son who would be king forever. In this passage, it says that it's going to be Jesus. And so, so, so my next question is, is maybe, is there a greater story here? 
Is there, is there a bigger story here that, that we're seeing? And maybe, maybe there's something like about this baby, because let's not miss the fact that not only is a word from the Lord powerful, but also the presence of Jesus is powerful. So you have a word from the Lord and, a, and, and the presence of Jesus who seem to be able to keep Mary and Joseph together in the midst of their chaos. I believe that whatever chaos you're walking through right now, if you know the word of God and you have the presence of Jesus in that chaos, you will be able to thrive. You will be, those are the ingredients. The word of God and the presence of Jesus through his Holy Spirit allows us to thrive, no matter what your chaos looks like. Well, what about this concept of a conquering peace? I mean, what, what, are, we, what are we talking about here? Um, in, in the Isaiah passage, there's, there's this... Um, there's this picture of a war that was like fought, won and over. So the imagery is there was a war, it was fought, but now it's over. Stuff gets folded up and, and put away. And then it references the Prince of Peace. So obviously he has the authority to do that. This is somebody who's, who, who can do those sort of things, who can give this sort of stuff away. And, um, and, and, but it's, but it's, not, it's not without war. It's not without cost. I mean, there's bloodshed involved in, in the Isaiah passage. Um, if you were to fast forward to Revelation 19, where it starts to maybe just make a note of that on your outline or your phones or whatever, where, where there's a picture of what's to come, you know, it's a really similar picture. I want to just go ahead and read it to you. It, it, it's a really similar picture. Jesus is coming back to renew all things in Revelation 19. Let me just give you a picture of what that looks like. Just so you have an idea that um, this conquering peace, this peace that requires war but conquers all things, is actually a, a, a biblical theme throughout. In verse 6 of Revelation 19, then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. He goes on, verse 11. Then I saw heaven opened up, and behold, a white horse, the one sitting on it called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That gives us a picture of what is coming when he comes to restore all shalom, there's like judgment, there's, there's like war, and then shalom. And it's a shalom that actually conquers. It's not just a shalom that has good sounds to it and nice smells. It's a shalom that destroys things that don't belong. There's this idea where it's more powerful than more powerful than. Um, it's more powerful than your darkness and your oppression. It's more, it's more powerful than the details of how many years you've carried your chaos. It's just, more, it's just more powerful than that. That's just the way the peace of God works. You know, there's a saying in, in foster care system, and I think it would uh, pervade out to adoption or, or anyone who, who finds themselves like um, with a child who's been removed from the family that they were originally placed into. And here's how the saying goes. And, and foster parents, um, it, it's kind of like a thing. If, if we had a mandatory foster tattoo, this would be it. Okay, ready? Here's how it would go. If my heart has to break so theirs can heal, I'll do it. I mean, I, I just want peace for my kids. 
I just want them to experience the peace of Christ. And sometimes it feels like in our journey and in the journeys of others, it requires a breaking of a heart so theirs can heal. War and then peace. Seems to be the gospel way. Seems to be what the Prince of Peace brought us. And so we, we come to the question, what about thriving? Well, what would thriving look like in this type of peace for us today? I mean, if Jesus is the Prince of Peace and he is our warrior, what do we do? Is there fighting for us? How do we experience this in a way that's actually thriving and not just a way that we'll get to when he comes back? I'm super glad you asked. Verse 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. Again, transferable to us. There's a reference to the Holy Spirit and there's a reference to faith. Take a look at these, these, these R's here that we talked about last week. Remembering. Reading, rehearsing, and resting. If, in order to thrive in hope, the same things apply when it comes to peace. We need to remember where we are. We're in the in-between. That's an important place to, to, to be. We need to read. We need to, to be able to read the Word. It needs to be a, a, like a regular part of our rhythms, but we also need to read ourselves and see where our heart's trending and see where we're having to go. We need to rehearse the gospel, the truth, to ourselves and to one another, and then we need to learn how to rest in what we already have. The reason rehearsing is underlined, again, is because it seems like one of the great obstacles to our peace, the battle that we have to fight, is not on a cross and for our sins, but is what we would call unbelief. It's the great battle of unbelief. It seems like that's the battle we're called into. Christ went to a cross. He took your sin and mine, and he went to a war for us because we would lose that war 10 out of 10 times. The wrath of the Father placed on Christ for you and for me. Him dying, overcoming sin and death, and on the third day saying, I got this. Now all you need to do is get me, and we're good. It's super cool to participate with me, by the way. A, a, a noisy church is a church that I'm at home in, okay? So I think that God wants to meet us, and we're supposed to experience God together. So just like the worship, if you want to yell, if you want to, like, I invite that. It helps me to, to, like, think that God's actually moving and doing something. So please, amen at all you want. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So Listen. If our, great, if our great battle is with unbelief, well, let's, let's just take a look at, at where some of our weapons might be. Um, th- these, are, these are four G's that I live with. Anybody know the four G's? If you finish your time at this church and there's a second thing I want you to get, right behind Jesus, it would be the four G's. Hey, check this out. What do you think this does to your, your chaos or your, your unpeaceful, your, your unrestful heart? God is great, so I don't have to be in control. Like in Christ, if somebody comes to Christ and believes in his finished work that I just said, they repent of their sin, they turn, they change their mind about like their self-salvation, they're like, Jesus, you are my only and thriving hope. I trust in you. If somebody comes and, and they forgive me, give me new life, they come to Christ in that way, then these four G's become true. The question is, how are we rehearsing them to ourselves and to one another? God is great, so I don't have to be in control. Don't you think that would conquer a lot of the chaos that you live in? I mean, don't you think that there would be a power about that word of the voluntary slavery that we all choose to live in at times if that became more and more true? Or what about God is good, so I don't need to look elsewhere? That would conquer a lot of the chaos where we're looking elsewhere for our good and our treasure. God is glorious, so I don't need to fear others. Man, that's a powerful word. I don't need you, your approval. I don't need to suck the life out of you in order to feel something. I've already got all the approval I need in Christ, and now I'm free to love you. That is a peace that conquers. 
It conquers this chaos. It conquers the way that we relate to one another. It conquers all of those old patterns and behaviors. How about this last one? God is gracious. So I don't have to prove myself. How much would that conquer in your chaotic being? David Guzik writes this. To have this perfect peace, your mind cannot occasionally come to the Lord. It has to be stayed on him. To be kept in this perfect peace, our mind must be stayed on the Lord. If our mind is stayed on ourselves, on our problems, or the problem people in our lives, or on anything else, we can't have this perfect peace. This is the heart that says with the Apostle Paul, that I may know him, Philippians 3. Satan loves to get our minds on anything else except God and his love to us. You can't come to God occasionally and expect to thrive in peace. I'm reading this new book. I'm out. This is it right here. I want to leave you with this thought. I'm reading this new book called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And it's just touching my soul like crazy. The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And here's the deal. He's encouraging us with all that we are to slow down enough to create a context where we can actually read our Bible, where we can pray, where we can be with one another, where we can be in small groups so that we can rehearse the gospel and fight this battle against our unrestful hearts. Let's sing. So as we close with the rest of this song, I'm going to invite our prayer partners up. Man, you might need some peace today. You might need to be prayed over that the Prince of Peace would show up in a new and fresh way because it's just been chaos and you've kind of lost your way and you're, you're losing that battle of unbelief. You know, a great place to start is simply by saying, I can't do this. Jesus, not only will you give me salvation, but will you give me the faith to experience it both now and in that day? And what a great way to be prayed over as we leave today. They're going to finish out the song, but we're going to open up our prayer partners, and I'm going to give you your benediction right now. Now, may the God of peace give you what is rightfully yours in Christ in increasing measure and draw you to it if you've never experienced it before. Amen and amen.
Sunday.